Welcome back for another episode of the Modern Pain Podcast. This week is a reunion episode as I got to sit down and speak with my bud and former co-host Jared Hall. We chatted about the need for physical therapists to transition from being more revenue generators to really crucial cost savers in the healthcare system. We're going to explore some side programs that offer counseling and education as alternative income streams and highlight the role of physical therapists as health quarterbacks for patients. Jared speaks to the importance of collecting data to prove cost-saving benefits of physical therapy over time, emphasizing that immediate financial gain shouldn't be the sole focus of us trying to better represent ourselves in healthcare. We discuss the untapped opportunities in lifestyle and wellness services for physical therapists, including examples like fitness and wellness programs. And lastly, Jared and I get into the systemic challenges we face, particularly in the U.S., that make it difficult to implement cost-saving strategies on a really large scale. It was great talking with Jared, and this episode will give you some ideas of how we can tackle some of the financial challenges we face as a profession. Enjoy the episode. This is the Modern Pain Podcast with Mark Cartula. Welcome to the podcast, Jared Hall. <laughs> it's good to be here, man. Uh, you know, just like we were talking about before we went on live, it's, uh, it's been a minute since we have jumped on one of these calls. We used to do it all the time and have our regular touch base, but I've still been following along on the podcast, listening to all these really good interviews you've been doing. So I'm glad to come back on for a little bit of a, uh, you know, reminiscing session. You know, when when we kind of stopped doing it together, it was interesting. I don't know how you were, you were, but it was. I was feeling questions like, "Did we have a messy divorce or something like that?" Where it was just some some sort of ugly situation where where we just had to part ways or things like that. And it, it literally it was just a burnout situation for me, and I think a little bit of the same for for Jared as far as just like we needed to step back, catch our breath, regain some footing and some prioritization in life. And uh, thankfully, we both have. We've chatted before this we'll chat here on the podcast that you know things are going well and and uh life's good on both ends so so we're happy to have you back man it's 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 it is something that where we were you know chatting on a pretty much two to three week basis you know wrapping up you we usually just would crunch out three to four episodes at a time and then have a little month to just kind of catch our breath and then get back at it each month and yeah it's good to, good to have you back now uh you're a little bit still in the clinic. I know you're teaching still a bit, but you've you've taken more of a role in the the management aspect of our profession. And I've seen you seen you share content on you know that perspective and seeing things from that view because I I would agree with you and and others that there's a little bit of a lack of understanding from a just definitely new grad physical therapist, even existing PTs, on what it means to run a successful practice that allows folks to have. The benefits the and all the things that we all want as physical therapists i think there's a little i know there was for me a little naivety of, of the whole situation so i'd love if you could just kind of discuss maybe what your role is now and what you're up to overall and then and then maybe just kind of touch upon your perspective and how maybe it's shifted as you've kind of seen yourself move into some of this more still 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 talking to some patients but obviously doing a little bit more on the management side of things i'd love to hear what your perspective has been with that role yeah yeah you know i'm i'm pretty fortunate right now at least i uh, i get to have some diversity in my life i get to treat patients about 8 hours a week work with patients on average sometimes a little bit more sometimes a little bit less sometimes a lot more if somebody's on vacation and i really need to step in and uh you know cover their clinic and that sort of thing um I'm in the thick of teaching at the local PT school right now in their orthopedic curriculum. So I always help in their uh, orthopedics one, orthopedics two, or what we call MSK one, MSK two. I Now I get to help a little bit in their business course here and there and do a little bit with therapeutic exercise. So that's always fun. But then, you know, the main thing that I'm doing on a day to day basis is. I oversee about eight clinics, um, oversee about 15, 1600 patient visits a week, um, a little, probably 30, 30 therapists. I can't really, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. So I am doing a lot of, you know, management and mentorship on operations of clinics and looking at PNL spreadsheets and understanding, uh, you know, trends that, that are driving positive business growth or, you know, uh, expansion of a clinic and, and that sort of thing, physician relations, um, things that are not going well, you know, from clinic culture to uh, clinic efficiency to patient experience, um, you know, helping helping therapists and clinic directors understand that and, and see, uh, you know, what really makes us a, 
you know, profitable or, you know, keep the ability to, to, to maintain uh, providing salaries and benefits to people and to keep the doors open and, you know, all of that sort of stuff and trying to find that, that little sweet spot, that little area in the middle that um, makes people happy, makes a firm clinic, makes an effective clinic, uh, isn't a mill and doesn't sell your soul out, but still is profitable. And, you know, you're able to, to keep your doors open and, and all that sort of stuff, or, you know, pay out bonuses here and there. And it, it, you know, it's, it is a tightrope. It's a balancing act. It's, it's really, it's really interesting. Uh, some of the stuff that I have learned over time and how much I have come to understand that the average, the average person, the average therapist, even if they've been a therapist for 20 years, might not have any clue what this stuff looks like on the back end and, you know, what's relevant and what's important and what's not. And, uh, you know, when it comes to maintaining a, a, a profitable or, or, you know, decent business. So it's just, it's been uh, a heck of a learning experience for me over the last couple of years to really get elbows deep in, in understanding what this stuff looks like. I was talking with you before I, when I did some clinic directing work, it was interesting to start peeking into P&L statements and, you know, budgeting and, and all the things that go along with it, um, not to the extent that you're doing it. But and then as I look at the social media landscape and, and see a lot of like new grad PTs or, you know, d, you know student uh, physical therapists who are talking about some of their expectations rolling into the profession. And then I'm like... I, I admire the expectations, I, I, but sometimes I wonder if there's a little bit of a utopian view of, of for, for students and even some early career professionals who maybe don't have that footing and that understanding of the whether we like it or not, you know, we have to be fiscally responsible as businesses to be able to maintain, like you said, paying salaries, giving benefits, vacation time, all the things that we all want. Um, but sometimes I think expectations versus reality of, of what fiscally you know, we, we are able to do can be two different things. I'm curious what your, th what your experience has been and what you've seen out there as far as the, cause I, I've seen you posting on it a little bit as well of what students and early career professionals are talking about what they expect and what they think they deserve coming into the profession. And then what the reality is of, of what you see sometimes out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, what, what students expect or, or, or you know, new grads, uh, expect and what is, you know, possible and what is realistic are not always super close together. Um, I would say in general, you know, I think that there's been a dramatic increase in starting salaries and that sort of thing over the last couple of years, heavily, heavily driven by inflation. And, you know, what I, what I do have to say is the things yeah. that I talk about are in the Texas market in Dallas, Fort Worth. It, it, these are markets that I understand well. And, you know, there are other markets that I don't understand as well, but have some knowledge about some other states and things like that. But there are plenty of places that could be very different than what I'm saying. And, that's also just the reality of the situation. There's there's regional differences on costs of living and, and what insurance companies pay for physical therapy and, and all of that sort of stuff. So you have to take into account that the things that I'm saying are, are for the markets that I know. Uh, so they could vary a little bit. Um, but in general, you know, with inflation, with all this stuff that's gone on over the last couple of years, uh, it's made running a business a lot more difficult because all of a sudden insurance companies don't pay any more, but the cost of running that business has inflated about 10%. You know, if you look at commercial real estate and you look at the, the salaries that are being demanded and you look at the cost of providing benefits and, and, and that sort of thing, all of those things have gone up, but we don't really have the ability to set our price very easily in in, in, in the medical profession, in, in physical therapy. Like we do negotiate, you know, we try to negotiate with insurance companies, but almost never do they say, yeah, we'll pay you 10% more for this thing because it's gotten more expensive for you to run your business. Um, most often they're saying, yeah, we're going to pay you less this year. Sorry, bud. Like we used to give you 12 approved visits and now you get six approved visits or whatever it is. And you know, anybody that's listening at all knows that every every year Medicare tries to reduce how much they pay physical therapists. Uh, they're always trying to to 
cut us by two or four or six or 12 percent or whatever. They're always trying to cut us. And we have to go and negotiate and we have to go and scream at them and pick it and all that sort of stuff and say, don't cut us. You know, I know that you have a balanced budget. You got to cut somebody else. <laughs> you got to you got to take that money from somewhere else and, and don't take it from us. Otherwise, we're just not going to be able to see your patients anymore. Uh, so that's a that's a real interesting phenomenon um, that, that goes on. And when I would say more often than not, when folks are coming out of school, they're early career professionals, they have um, a mix of desires. Uh, but the number one, the, the top few desires that I see are uh, first and foremost, people want mentorship. And, you know, what what does mentorship look like? A lot of people aren't aren't, um, you know, really sure what that should look like for them. They have this idea that, hey, I want mentorship. I'm a new grad. I don't, I'm scared to just be thrown in here. Well, you need to talk to an employer about what does mentorship look like? Does that look like they pair you up with somebody that you have their personal cell phone number and you can call them you know, at any point in time and you can bounce ideas off of them or you can get feedback? Does that look like formalized mentorship in a clinic where you know, once a week or once every other week, you get to treat for an hour or two with another therapist. You know, does that look like a, a, a virtual program that is a cohort of students that, <clears throat> or a cohort of new, new grads that kind of get put in that together and they have monthly touch bases? There's a lot of different ways to do mentorship and people almost invariably say, man, I want to have a little bit of mentorship. I don't want to be thrown into the fire. Um, in general, everybody is saying, I want to treat patients. I want to treat patients one on one. You know, I want one on one time with folks, and that's also something that they need to get clarification on. Because what does one on one mean in your book? Does one on one mean I want to treat you know eighty patients a week for thirty minutes, and I want to see each one of those patients for thirty minutes, and you know I see somebody at seven, and then I see somebody at seven thirty, and then I see somebody at eight, and then I see somebody at eight thirty. Does that look like I want to see forty patients, and I want to see every single patient for an hour with no overlap with other patients and things like that, um, or does that look like, well, you know, I want to see you know, I'm OK seeing 60 visits a week and recognizing that that is an average of 12 visits a day. And there will be some time where I definitely have patients that I can treat one on one. And there will be some time where I have patients that are maybe a little bit overlapped with each other. Uh, two folks that are eight weeks after a knee replacement and it's super cake to treat them at the same time versus I have the flexibility on my schedule to designate folks that I want to see one on one that I think need my full undivided attention no matter what. So that can look a lot of different ways as well. And, you know, I, the company that I, that I work for, we kind of fall in that last scenario that I talked about. Our, <clears throat> our expectations are, hey, we want you to see somewhere between like 54 and 60 patient visits a week. And uh, I would say that that is middle of the road. There are plenty of places where you will see more than that. There are plenty of places that you can go and see less than that, but you have to factor in. What are my what is my salary? What is my benefits? You know, what is my ability to bonus? What are all these other things? Right. Because in general, what I'm telling students and new grads now is that um, no job is perfect. You have to pick what type of not being perfect that you're comfortable with, you know, is 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 money first and foremost for you or is uh, flexibility in schedule, or is one-on-one -on -one patient care, or is you know really good benefits because you have a family and you need health insurance and you need good 401k? Is it a great continuing education budget with mentorship? Like, What is the flavor of not perfect that best suits you? Because you just literally are not going to find a place that can provide you all of those things because all of those things cost money and their margins are very, very thin in the physical therapy world. So for us, we, like I said, we do that 55 to 60 visit range a week with the ability to designate, you know, any patient that you really need to see one-on-one. -on -one. You, you classify them and say, this person, they've got some complex stuff going on, man. I, I cannot, I cannot handle seeing them with another person. But then you, you say, hey, well, I got two guys that had their knee replaced eight weeks ago. They're crushing it. They have no, you know, 
comorbid conditions. They have nothing that's worrying me. Uh, it's actually fun for them to come in together because they like to hang out and they like to shoot the shit. And those, those two dudes, it actually creates a better therapy experience for them to be in with another patient because it's almost like, uh, you know, a workout buddy or something like that. So you look at your schedule and, and we encourage our therapists to have a lot of um, control over their schedule. They have the ability to take that control. And some therapists do. They're like, yeah, I want to schedule my own patients because I want to know who's coming in when and at what time and who may or may not be overlapped with another person. Other therapists say, no, nah, I don't care. I'll let, the, I'll let the front office take care of it. My, my front office manager can schedule folks however they want to do it. So, you know, I, again, that's me speaking to my area, but there are in, in the Texas in the Texas world in the in the private practice world, it is not uncommon <clears throat> to have clinics that see, you know, your expectation is to see 70 or 80 visits a week. Uh, I know some private practice owners that they see 90 to 100 patient visits a week themselves. And um, <clears throat> I, I've gotten to where I don't say negative things about that anymore like I used to, because I understand now how difficult it is to keep your doors open. And some of those folks, that, that guy that's running his private practice by himself, and he's seeing 90 visits a week. I guarantee he doesn't want to see 90 patient visits a week himself, but I guarantee you that he has to, to pay for the things that he needs to pay for to keep his business open and to get him to the point where he can hire a second therapist and that sort of thing. So I, I used to say, well, that is just God awful and all that sort of stuff. I don't say that anymore because I understand how difficult of a position that those folks can be in. Um, so I'll stop right there because I've been just kind of talking about a lot of things and I'm sure you have some input or some other questions you want to ask Mark. No, I, I think you bring up something like I, I just can reflect back, like coming out of school, like I'm only seeing people one on one. Nobody's going to tell me to double book. And then I, I've seen the same thing, you know, happen clinically, whereas it's it's been happening in clinic and I've been open to double booking once my my ego and my fragile ego was OK with it. That, that all of a sudden I'm like, man, there's a lot of people who really dig this environment where there's another person with them and they're, they're really kind of in this together. They're, they're kind of sharing some of their stories. They're kind of showing that they're, you know, you know, kind of pushing each other along and things. So I think it can be done well. Now, obviously you don't need to in certain instances and like having the flexibility, like you said, where some folks probably do need one-on-one -on -one care and some, you know, t you know, one-on-one -on -one of your time to, to be able to listen and validate what's going on with people. But yeah, there, it can be done well. It is okay to see, you know, some folks, you know, that might overlap a little bit, but there's some folks, and again, I used to be this person where, oh my God, that's horrible. You should never do that. Um, but again, I think there's definitely ways you can do it well. And you guys are obviously doing it, doing it well. Um, I'd love to hear, cause you're seeing the, you're, you're seeing things obviously in the Dallas Fort Worth market. So it, it, again, it may not always apply. And I, you know, I think Phoenix is somewhat similar. Um, but, uh, the the challenges you see out there as you're kind of seeing things down the road as far as are there any storms brewing on the horizon that you are i've seen you post some discussions about this but and we don't have to be doomsday there's a lot of good things to think about here in, in, in pt we, we have a, a privilege of, of helping a lot of folks and, and and still a relatively healthy profession but i'm just curious uh, what storms you see brewing on the horizon as you've been able to kind of see things more big picture in the profession Oh man. Uh, yeah, we can talk about a few things. I would say <clears throat> the number one problem that I see right now, well, there's, there's two main problems, uh, and they both deal with money. Um, because ultimately, you know, none of us are doing this for free. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to go treat patients for 40 hours a week, 45 hours a week for free. Uh, so insurance payment for physical therapy care if you look at you know a, a chart over the last three decades, you will see that that number has stayed the same or actually gone down a, a bit. So I was talking to the owners of my company the other day and they said, hey, when we started this business in the 1990s, we got paid about $97 a visit for you know physical therapy. Now let's fast forward 30 years and we're averaging about $90 a visit for physical therapy now. So you've gone down $7 per visit in 30 years, but 
inflationary pressures, the cost of running that business, the salaries that people want, the cost of providing benefits has gone up astronomically. And if you just take your little normal 2% inflation year over year, you know, the Fed tries to target 2% inflation. This is why annual raises, you know, just standard merit increases year over year are usually in the two to 3% range. You're given that merit raise to help show to to help keep up with inflation, right? We're assuming everything is becoming two percent more expensive year over year. So we need to give you two to three percent more money to both keep up with that. And if you do a great job, maybe you know you get four or five percent uh, of a raise or six percent or whatever it is. If you're crushing it, you've proven yourself to be a great a great employee, a great therapist, so on and so forth. Um, you'll get a raise over what that, you know, standard inflationary number is. So if you look at just inflation 2%, if the cost or if, if what we've been paid or what we are being paid for physical therapy had increased at normal inflationary rates, that 97 from 1990 should be about $160 a visit now, $164 or $5 a visit. So if what we've been paid increased at the same rate of but if that number had increased at the same rate as, you know, the cost of running a business, we we would be getting paid one hundred and sixty some odd dollars a visit. And we're just not. We're being paid less. And, uh, you know, that's a crop that's wildly different across the board for different insurance companies and, and that sort of thing, because um, I know like in Texas, Blue Cross Blue Shield is a great payer. Um, they pay us. They pay us pretty well. If you see a person with Blue Cross Blue Shield, you can easily get paid over a hundred dollars a visit, hundred and ten, hundred and fifteen, hundred and twenty dollars a visit. Um, but if you go across the, the the state line into Arkansas, it's my understanding that Blue Cross Blue Shield is one of the worst payers in in Arkansas. And I don't know how it is in you know in Arizona, but you see these differences. So Blue Cross Blue Shield helps save us a little bit in, in Texas because you've got folks like Cigna that in, in Texas only want to pay $59 for a physical therapy session. And I can tell you that, you know, people want to make, you know, you're like, I've got a doctorate degree. I want to be making $50 an hour or whatever it is. Um, and, and there's not a lot of there's not a lot of room in there if you're getting paid fifty nine dollars, but you get paid 50, 50 and you've got to run your business and you got to pay for support staff and you got to pay for utilities and so on and so forth. So it, it's interesting on those margins, and that's why you know a lot of folks don't accept certain insurances and and that sort of thing. And ultimately, it's patients that end up suffering as a result of that because. If if their insurance doesn't pay worth a darn, well, they have to go to the only place that will see them. And that place likely is running at a very, very high productivity expectation because they're seeing, uh, you know, they're getting paid so little. So you've got to be partnered up. You've got to be double booked or triple booked to make that hour even financially viable for that business. Because um, a business just, you know, you're not in the you're not in business to lose money. Uh, so that's the number one problem that I see and that we've got to do something about. We've got to get creative about. We've got to somehow figure out how to change the way that insurance companies uh, value what it is that we do. And then the, the second problem is the cost of education has gotten pretty darn high. Um, in particular, if you <clears throat> if you're not able to go to a state school, if you either choose to or are only accepted into a private school and they have a very high tuition and you have to take out student loans to do so, being saddled with a really high debt, you get out of school and your you know your monthly debt payment is a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars a month. Uh, that's really difficult because what it ends up doing is it forces people coming out of school to choose to work in uh, settings that maybe they don't want to work in and then they can never they can never really change or they can never go back you you have to go into travel therapy because it pays a lot even though you don't really love the the weird scenarios you get thrown into it's hard to stop doing that because you're you're paying off that debt and then when you do pay off that debt you're like well I don't want to 
I don't want to take a big pay cut to go work in an outpatient clinic that I would really like to work in. You know, I don't want to do that because I'm used to this much money coming in uh, or a lot, lots of folks end up in, in home health and that sort of thing that maybe didn't really want to be in home health, but that's where you can get paid really well. Um, so there, there's some interesting things there and, you know, uh, the cost of education with how much we get paid. Uh, I think the, I don't know if it was the APTA or not. It might have been the APTA. There was a there was a study that was done a couple of years ago that showed, you know, the return on investment for the the physical therapy degree has crossed the threshold to where it's not really that good of a return on investment based on the average debt amount and the average salary nationwide. Yeah, no, you you're definitely uh, hitting some topics that I would definitely agree with you on being part of higher education and, um, you know, seeing the, the debt load that students are coming out with, I, I, it's tough, man. And I, I honestly, I've had discussions, like if my daughter came to me, you know, six, you know, 16 years or so from now saying she wants to be a PT in this current climate, I'd have a hard time is if that was her passion and what she wanted to do, then I would fully hundred percent support her But with, as long as she was fully educated on, Here's what you're getting into. Obviously, you know, we'd help her financially as best we could as a parent, but here's what you're, you're getting into and here's what the, the return on investment is. And I just think we have some work to do as a profession. I know there's some things beyond our control um, with, you know, politics and, and, you know, we, our lobby doesn't have the power of, you know, the other lobbies out there that are spending oodles more dollars to, to influence polit political things going on. But yeah, it's a tough situation. And then you got grads coming out where they're choosing, finance versus, you know, career development, which I get it. I, I don't blame anybody if they want to do home health or travel PT to kind of offset, even though they might, their heart might be in, God, if I could get in an outpatient situation where I was getting some serious mentorship. Now realize mentorship costs and like to have somebody mentor you. And that's, this is something that I was fortunate where I chose mentorship versus a high salary early on um, because it gave me a lot more ability to then push for higher salary down the road when my skills were, you know, at a better place and, and was able to, you know, garner a lot more, you know, respect in the patient community to where I, you know, I had some you know value to bring to a company because I had a, a decent referral base and things like that. But yeah, it is, it is a tough situation out there. I think there's still g good things to say about it. I don't, it's not obviously a doomsday scenario, but hopefully we can figure out some ways to, um, you know, find some ways the insurance companies, like you said, can value us more and give us some more reimbursement to, to justify. I mean, obviously we, we can show, we have enough data to show conservative care versus a lot of expensive care. Um, really com you know, comparable. The fact that it, to get an opioid prescription, it's so freaking cheap in this country yet to, to get a bout of physical therapy covered, to get a $250,000 multi-level fusion procedure covered, Versus, you know, a, a 12 bout visit of physical therapy. It's just there's a lot of broken things in our system that I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir with with you and to a lot of folks that are are listening. Um, what else can we talk about, man? There's a lot of a lot of things out there. Any other thoughts you have that you want to roll roll through? Yeah, I mean, while you were while you were speaking there, the only thing I could hear was the people that are going to listen to this and say, well, that's why you just don't take insurance. You go into a cash based physical therapy clinic and let me teach you how to start your own cash based physical therapy clinic. And a lot of those people need to be kicked in the shin, to, to be honest, because. Sure, a cash-based physical therapy clinic is the best. If you can charge people $150 to come in and see you and you can see people one-on-one -on -one, and you can fill your schedule up with 35 to 40 patient visits a week, yes, that is awesome. Yes, that's phenomenal. But the reality of the situation is that is only viable for a very small percentage of the population that has that, um, you know, expendable income to be able to pay cash for your services. A lot of people even that do have that expendable income would say, I also pay for health insurance. Screw that. Uh, I'm going to go pay a $25 copay at this other place down the road. I'm not going to pay you $150, even if maybe you are a little bit better or whatever it is. And then let's talk about just demographically and uh, geographic, demographically, geographically across the nation, that cash based physical therapy clinic can only survive in certain areas. It can only survive in certain zip codes. It can only 
you know, service so many people and the rest of the folks in the world have health insurance and they need to go to a clinic that takes their health insurance and they need to get care provided to them in that model. So while, yes, I think that those cash based physical therapy clinics are wonderful Everybody can't do them, you know, period. Everybody can't do that. <laughs> that, that, that market hits a, hits a saturation pretty fast, you know, depending on where you're at. So I, I have to throw that out there because I'm pretty tired of, of, of seeing new grads and, and stuff like that. People come out of school and they're sold a story on how they can be successful and make so much money doing their own cash based practice and this, that, and the other. And then a year later, they've, they've, a not, they've had a year of not making very much income. They've had a year of putting their loans into default. They've had a year of dumping money into a business and marketing a website and things like that. And it doesn't really pan out. And then they just have to go and they have to close up shop. You know, I, I'm seeing this on a regular basis. You know, we're a larger company in the DFW area and in Texas. And we have private practice owners literally calling us all the time saying, can you can you buy me out? Because I, I can't make a profit anymore. This is really tough. I'm tired. I'm tired of 60 hour weeks. I'm tired of scrounging and scrambling like it, it's not it's not, you know, profitable for me anymore. Will you buy my clinic? And then we have to look at it and run, you know, financials and say, <sighs> not really, dude. <laughs> We're not going to make any clinic. We're not going to make any money on your clinic either. So we can't just give you money. Or they say like, oh man, you know, I've put blood, sweat, and tears into this, and um, I think my I think my physical therapy clinic is worth a million dollars. Will you pay me a million dollars? And then we look at it and we're like, well, your your EBITDA is you know about thirty thousand dollars a year. And we can pay you a, a five times multiple on that. So we can we can pay you one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, not a million dollars. I know you value it a million dollars, but the reality of the numbers say that if we paid you a million dollars and you're only making thirty thousand dollars a year, we're never going to make our money back on this. Like it's going to take uh, it's going to take two decades to make our money back on this. But if we pay you a five times multiple, well, we can make our money back in four to five years. And then that, that becomes a little bit profitable for us at that point. It becomes, you know, a, a net positive on our portfolio rather than a, a net negative. A lot of people don't really uh, recognize that. Yeah, no, I echo your sentiments on the the, the cash based craze. I do think it, it, it's a model, and if if somebody really does their homework, understands economics, understands some of the socioeconomics of the area they serve or they want to serve, and they make a good educated decision versus this like you know utopian lifestyle of of you're making all this money, you don't have to treat all the time, and it exists. I mean, it, there, but it exists like you said in places that can support it. And I do think that it comes with a lot of business and marketing chops to be able to show significant value and to be able to do good in sales, which, you know, a lot of folks, you know, get, you know, especially PTs, we cringed even to hear the word sales, yet we sell every time we're trying to get somebody to commit to a plan of care. It's just, you know, without the, with the insurance, let alone with, you know, cash base behind it. So I think, um, you know, I, I agree. I think sometimes it gets pushed upon folks. And I've, I've also seen folks who've gotten sold the, the cash based fantasy. And again, it, it doesn't have to be a fantasy. If you do you good homework, you understand the reality of what you're getting into. You understand that, you know, you need to do your homework to make sure you live in a economic uh, area that can support such a, such a clinic, then knock, knock yourself out and, and, and crush it. I mean, I think Jared and I would both root up heavily for you to do it, but just buyer beware on a lot of that stuff as far as make sure you you understand a lot of what goes into to making one of those practices work. And yeah, it's it, it isn't as is is you know, rainbows and butterflies sometimes when um again and, and competitions out there. I, I there was a point in my life, you know, probably even what, five, six years ago where I was like, I'm just gonna start my own thing. And then it was having these discussions with folks in your situation and private practice owners who are burning out and all these things. And there are some folks who are crushing it and doing well and loving life. And, you know, so I'm not by all means saying this is what everything, but I, I think there's some sobering realities that we just need to be aware of that, you know, you know, do your homework, understand the finances behind what you're doing. Um, even as a staff clinician, I think it's helpful to just talk with your manager of like, I'd love to better understand what goes into you know, the financial runnings of the clinic, I think it helps you as a physical therapist understand some things. If you have aspirations of being 
a clinic owner, a clinic director, it, it helps you start navigating your way up that ladder, maybe within a company like Jared's where they, you start showing an interest and, and managers notice that and they say, hey, this person's really showing an interest. Um, and that might be your, your way to kind of climb up the scale a little bit and, and earn yourself into a you know, better salary and, and uh, more managing stra- you know, capabilities. But you can also be a great clinician too. You can treat patients you know, and, and see a productive schedule, have great reviews, you know, your productivity, which I think y- your company sounds very realistic. You know, I'm not hearing, you know, three or four people quadruple booked and, and all these things. I think appropriate use of, of your census and, and, you know, keeping patients at the center. Uh, I think you can still have a great career and a very satisfactory career. But uh, I also, to kind of circle back to your education thing, I know we spoke about it already. I think there's some challenges out there um, uh, with how much uh, tuition is he- where that's heading as well. I think if you look at that same graph you speak of, of what reimbursements look like over the last 30 years, again, how much inflation and things are and then how much tuition has changed. God, I, God, when I came out, my, my debt load and I was pretty aggressive taking loans out at, cause I was, you know, typically irresponsible. I was taking loans out to go to freaking spring break for good, for God's sake. I, I, I came out with like 40,000 and I thought that was like a monumental, you know, mountain to climb. And I'm, I, and now I hear folks where it's like five, six times that coming out of school. It makes me like, just get like ill in my stomach to hear that. Uh, that's a large load. And some folks are doing amazing things, paying that off. But man, we do have some challenges ahead of us to, to, to kind of hopefully reform some things. And, uh, but we still work in a, a great profession. I, I won't uh, get us too down in here. And we have a great opportunity to serve some folks. I think, I'll be interested to see if there's ways, uh, especially with the way we can get in front of patients and get our message out there. I just wonder how much, and I'd be curious your thoughts too on this, Jared, as far as how much continuing to beg for the scraps from, um, you know, insurance companies and different things like that versus, uh, you know, and, and, and trying to lobby towards physician groups and things. I'm, I'm not saying those are, we shouldn't do that because those are obviously important initiatives and we need to maintain that. But I'm just curious if you see any emerging models or many ways that we can maybe get our messages out to the to directly in front of patients or, or um, do some things to maybe start uh, being creative with our our ways of delivering services versus um, the, you know the traditional you know beg for insurance companies who over the last 30 years haven't <laughs> really shown any signs of, of moving in a positive directions for us what are your thoughts well I mean in general and I know that this is this is pie in the sky but um, <sighs> we have to step into a role of not only just rehabbing people who have pain and or or are injured or had surgery, but being like stewards and champions of actual health. And I think that the reason that insurance companies pay physical therapy less now, the reason that we're in all of these problems, the reason that, you know, Medicare has a balanced budget, but they still have, they have to continue to lower what they pay is because, the United States in particular is very unhealthy. <laughs> like we are not a we are not a healthy population. We spend the most on healthcare, but we are like number 19 or 20 or all the way down to number 70 of, you know, number of, of how good we are on various health outcomes. And that is primarily driven by uh Nutrition, lack of exercise, lack of movement, you know, um, being overweight, being obese, metabolic dysfunction, so on and so forth, paired with longevity, lifespan has increased, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, how long or the last 50 years, how long the average person lives has gone up. So now when you get really sick and unhealthy at 55 years old, and uh, let's say 50 years ago, uh, let's just call it how it was, you would have been dead by 60. You're now living to 80 because modern medicine is keeping you alive. Medications and surgeries and all of this sort of stuff is keeping people alive longer that would not have necessarily been able to survive before we had these advancements. Well, what does that lead to? That leads to the healthcare system or insurance companies having to pay for very expensive care for a very long time while people live with, you know, very chronic and debilitating diseases and conditions that costs a lot of money. If we as physical therapists could step into being healthcare providers that mitigate some of those costs and we could justify to the system, 
hey, if people see P- a PT once a week or once every other week, and it's like a maintenance thing, it's a thing where we're a, a health coach and a movement coach and an accountability partner and a this and a that and uh, a, a, a resource for education on all things health and pain and injury and all of this sort of stuff. And we're saving the system bukus of money we should be able to reap the rewards of that. So in in my opinion, I would love to see physical therapists go that way as healthcare providers that of course rehab people and of course see people after injuries and surgeries and stuff like that. But we also become this general steward of, and we'll say, you know, quarterback of a patient's health, right? A, 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 a person's ability to minimize uh, how much metabolic dysfunction that they get into a person's ability, a resource for minimization of over medicalization of normal injuries and, and pathology and things like that. Cause we all know that, you know, you see these pathological changes in a person's body over time that may or may not correlate super well with the pain that they're experiencing. And they go, get, they go and get an x-ray because if you go to the primary care doc, the primary doc is going to order an x-ray straight off the bat. They're going to get that radiologist report that says, destroyed spine syndrome. And then when they get destroyed spine syndrome, they're going to be sent to the surgeon. And, you know, there are a lot of great surgeons, but there are a lot of surgeons that just like to do surgery, you know, and that, that pays for things and they're surgeons and that's what they do. So you end up getting that $250,000 multi-level fusion that you referenced earlier. And that happens a lot, you know, that happens a whole lot. And you can pay for a lot of physical therapy visits and you can pay for a lot of things with $250,000 a pop or even fifty thousand dollars a pop you know on some of these surgeries that maybe aren't as as necessary and things like that so i think we have to be cost savers rather than revenue generators uh, that mindset and if you can save a lot of dollars then you maybe get a bigger slice of that dollar pie or we have side programs where we're doing counseling and education and uh, being again that that health quarterback for patients um, and, and that gets paid a, a, a dollar amount as well and that becomes another income stream or another revenue source for your business you know, outside of just the normal rehab, we're always going to be in rehab. And that's great. That's, that's awesome. But I think that we need to maybe look at other ways to to source revenue and try to figure out if we can get a bigger slice of that pie um, and, and realize some of the downstream savings that we might be able to help people with. The problem with that is, you got to get a research study to prove that you can save this dollar amount and you've got to be able to model what that dollar amount is over a certain population and come up with a payment structure for that. So this is a big lift. It's not something that's easy. It's not something that we could, you know, snap our fingers and do. But for me, it, it's a it's a direction I see that we should go as a profession to help you know, correct or mitigate what I see as the number one problem for our, our country and our, our healthcare system is how how just generally unhealthy we are. Uh, that's why universal healthcare would never ever ever work in the United in the United States because we are just too unhealthy. When you look at the countries that it does work in, places like Norway and Sweden and that sort of thing, in general those folks are a heck of a lot healthier than the average American. So their system is not just pouring money into the, the the treatment and maintenance of chronic diseases like we are in the United States, we would have to have like a, a 50% health tax or something like that to to actually provide like really good universal health care in the United States. And I don't see very many people raising their hand and saying, I would like to give away 50% of my income. <laughs> so you're, so you're, what you're telling me is like, dry needling level eight or manipulation level 16 isn't going to solve this problem. You know, I don't, maybe it has a role, but I don't think that that's going to be the the big thing that moves the needle. Yeah. Yeah. And I, again, I, I joke, but you know, I just think we still have a profession that wants to just do the rehab and find it and fix it approach where we have a huge opportunity and this is just, but I, I just, we could, if we step into the lifestyle wellness space, I have patients regularly who check in, you know, monthly and probably could do a lot more. I just, we just aren't in a situation and we're in a university setting where I'm not as fiscally 
under as much pressure uh, and, and things with that. But I think there is so much opportunity for wellness, osteoarthritis, God, keeping people moving, keeping them active. Uh, we, we own exercise while rehab. Why don't we own it as people progress and move forward and, and try to manage their conditions long term? Because guess what? That arthritic joint ain't, ain't going to go away. But their, their management strategy, you could be hanging alongside with those some folks who navigate persistent pain issues and get back to valued living things often need support. That whole restore back trial recently, booster sessions, you know, shown to help significantly. I mean, there's a lot of data out there. I think you do bring up good points. We need to start collecting data to show downstream. The problem is, is we want, we have such a like immediate gratification, like a healthcare system. Like if it doesn't immediately save money, it ain't worth it. Um, where if you, if you put in some studies and some time to where we get people downstream, how, how, if we prevent that, even a few, you know, multi-level fusions in a, in a, a year in our practice or, you know, total joint replacements and things like that, which we know they get thrown around a lot more liberally uh, due to some of the financial incentives out there and some of the biases of, of the practitioners. And again, we're biased as, as, as physios and things too with our conservative care approach. It's just a lot cheaper and a lot less invasive, I always tell patients. So, um, but yeah, there's there's some definite challenges systemically in the, in the healthcare system. I, I do th agree with you. We have a huge opportunity if we're willing to just put down the find it, fix it, a thought process and let's be the guide by the side, the whole Alfred phenomenon you've heard us rail about, you know, time after time on the podcast. Um, I just hope folks will take heed to that. I mean, we got folks, I got my friend, Joe Camerato, who's doing, uh, you know, teaching physical therapists, how to like get people into a, a program after they're done with care to start one as a, as a business, continue to bring in revenue. So, and you're serving a patient with some significant value. It's not like you're you have some like program that's just fleecing people money. You're you're saving them money downstream by getting them involved in such a you know fitness and wellness program. Uh, I'm gonna respect your time today, my friend. I really appreciate it. It's been good catching up with you. Uh, my blood pressure's raised appropriately, as it always is when we start talking about some of these topics. Uh, I'm just curious, anything you want to leave folks with before we part ways today? Uh, you know, nothing other than you. Please feel feel free to to reach out to me at any point in time. I'm an open book you know, on on uh, Instagram and Facebook. I'm something like at Dr. Jared Hall DPT or something like that. You know, um, I, I, I would also like to say yeah, I've I've been in this business and management thing for the last couple of years, which has caused a lot of people to interact with me now to not remember that I'm. I'm also a clinician and I was, I was a, I was an educator and clinician and stuff before I was in business. So that stuff is not lost on me. I've been there. I, I, I understand those things as well. Um, so I, there's no question that's off limits. So if you, if you want to pick my brain, you're, anybody is always, uh, you know, totally okay to do that. We'll definitely link uh, Jared's social profiles and let you reach out to him. He is not on the evil empire now that he's in management. He does still, hold clinical experience and still sees patients. So I think sometimes it's interesting to see like, oh, well, you're just in management now. You're you're on their their team. You're not really. Yeah, I think it's it's good to have that full perspective and see. I think it's a unique perspective. I mean, it, it just, there's a lot of folks who are so strictly clinical that they don't see the fiscal side. And I think you did a great job today bringing some of the, the challenges that we see um, when you look at the business side of what we do in healthcare. So appreciate your time today, my friend. Hope you and the uh, wife and family have a good uh, rest of your weekend. And uh, we hope to get you back on the podcast soon. Sounds good, man. All right. You all who are listening, we'd love to have you subscribe to the podcast on your podcast provider. And if you're on YouTube, we'd love to hear you or see you subscribe on YouTube. Drop a comment in the comments just so we can kind of hear what your thoughts are on some of the challenges we're facing here uh, financially. Not maybe just physio. You might be in a different profession or maybe you're a patient who's dealing with some of these financial challenges as well as you see insurance companies and other challenges that we spoke about today. So until next time, we'll talk to you all next episode.